Hi, welcome to tonight's event looking at the moderator's year in review. We're here at the Assembly Halls in Edinburgh and although you can't all be with us uh, in person, it's great to see some faces on the Zoom uh, and the screens in the hall. I'm obviously joined by Martin and I'll go to meet him just now, but we have got some videos tonight that we will discuss about Martin's year. We've got music and also a Q&A session. So if you're on Facebook or Zoom, please send in your questions or comments you'd like to put to Martin. Martin, hello, how are you? Hi Shona, uh, I'm feeling good and uh, delighted to be with you tonight and thoroughly looking forward to thinking back. Uh, it's good to think, isn't it, and to reflect on what's been. Yep, and as I say, we've got some videos tonight to help share what you've been up to the past year. So will we get into it with the first one? Let's get going. It was in October of 2019 that my nomination as moderator designate was made public. And what followed were a number of interviews and photo shoots and generally a time of great excitement for me and my family. It even included a trip to the cellar at 121 George Street to try on a moderatorial gown. There were months of planning that followed in and I moved to Edinburgh in the March of the year to finalise my planning and preparation. It was a lovely spring, clear, crisp blue days with blossoms of springtime resplendent at every corner. Each day for exercise I climbed Blackford Hill morning and night, but most of all it was an opportunity to stand and survey the city and thereby the country and to pray in preparation for what was coming for me. There was promise in the air. And then in the space of a few days in March, it became increasingly obvious that things were not going to be as normal. And yeah, that was a time of great disappointment for Elaine and I as we reckoned on what might be left of what we had planned. For all of us, we had to get used to living in new ways, with lockdown impacting almost every aspect of life, not least church. Good friends kept our spirits up, of course, with chocolates, which always helps. And then in the middle of May, my installation as moderator of the General Assembly. Well, it took place in an empty hall, but many thousands joined online. And it was a special occasion, despite the strangest of circumstances. I'm very grateful that it was Colin who prayed for me as I was installed to the role that he had carried so successfully in the preceding term. Well, so much for the installation day. Then it was home, cheese sandwiches and, well, lovely cake, of course. And then the realization that it was going to be different. It was going to be pretty well me at a computer. This really was the moderator who was all dressed up with nowhere to go. So what do you do in such circumstances? Here's what, you keep calm and you carry on. So Martin, your video there gave us an insight to the preparations you'd put into place for your moderatorial year and then obviously the impact of the COVID pandemic on that. Were you disappointed? I think it would be dishonest of me, Shona, to say that I wasn't disappointed to some extent. And I'm sure as I look back in years to come, I'll think about what might have been. But I'm not sorry because, you know, many people have been kind enough to say to me that they thought, this was the year for me to be moderator. And that's what it was. I served to the best of my abilities in what was a very challenging year. Do you know, I'm actually more sorry for other folk. I wasn't idle, I got on with the job. But I think about my congregation, for example, who would have loved to be sitting up there in the gallery above us right now on the day of my installation. They would have loved that. And I'm really sorry for Elaine, my wife, because for her, it's been more or less a non-event, and that's a real shame. And I'm sorry for my chaplains, Gregor and Catherine, who, 
you know, we're ready to serve, and it hasn't worked out much for them. For my own part, yeah, disappointed, but not sorry, because I got to serve. Mm -hmm. So, how did you manage to refocus and, and cope with the changes you did have to make? Well, it had to be done quickly. I had to adapt. I had six months of planning a program, and then in two weeks it was all torn to bits. Uh, and I realized, obviously, it was going to have to be digital. So I guess the good thing shown is that I wasn't coming at that as a novice. Uh, I'm very used to social media, to streaming, to making films and so on. So I think in that sense, maybe that's what people mean, that it was right for me to be the moderator this year. I had some of the skill set and I could quickly uh, turn the ship and get on the right course. No, definitely. And I mean, it's clear from that video that you did, though, have aspirations and plans that didn't go ahead. But was there anything that you did as a result of the pandemic that you obviously didn't foresee yourself doing that turned into being a real highlight for you? I think there's lots of things and maybe some of that will cover through the remainder of this evening. But, you know, um, one thing stands out. It was when I got to go on BBC Radio Scotland on Off The Ball. Now, I'm football daft, people know that, and Off The Ball's been a programme that I've been right into all of my life. So to be with Stuart and Tam, to talk football, but also have little moments in there to share something of my faith, that was a highlight, and, uh, and it happened uh, because we had to find new ways to communicate. So, yeah, I'll look back with fondness on that. <laughs> And so obviously we saw there at the end, your motto was keep calm and carry on. But was there any hymn or a Bible verse in particular that kind of helped you through the past year and, and he helped you stay focused? Yeah, my great aunt, long gone, she used to teach me Bible verses and some of them I still have today. And from the end of the 40th chapter of Isaiah, there are wonderful words of encouragement telling us that in, this, in essence, sometimes life's tough. Sometimes we get weary and worn and feel like giving up perhaps, but trusting in God, we find strength to keep going. Shona, you've got a Bible. Why don't you just read it out and let people hear it? So for any day at home, I'm reading uh, from Isaiah 40, chapter, uh, chapter 40, verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Hmm. Thanks, Shona. I mentioned that I was disappointed that Elaine wasn't able to share more of this year with me. And folks would have seen what a blessing Elaine could have been to the church nationally at this time. Well, for tonight, uh, we pre-recorded Elaine singing a couple of songs. The first one, it's called, It Is Well. Again, a reminder that even in the toughest of times, that God is right there with us. And so we can say, yeah, it is well. Enjoy the song. And earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Yeah. 
it for me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea and through it Well, of course, I would rather have met people in person, but I was thankful for video conferencing technology, without which I would have been entirely redundant as moderator. It allowed me to meet all kinds of people, fascinating, inspiring people from all walks of life. Sometimes one-to-one, sometimes small groups, and then sometimes as part of large conferences and events that would have been in person in other circumstances. I was very moved at the 10-year remembrance of the conflict in Syria and at the special Holocaust Memorial Day service. Even so, let me be honest, there were times when it got very wearing. I had over a thousand Zoom calls alone. So you'll forgive me that a couple of times I resorted to some football just to keep me going. In November, I spent a couple of days with Crossreach no need to keep going then, it was inspiring on all on its own. 
brilliant work being done in the name of the church. And then, at the Scottish Parliament, with the presiding officer, a meeting with the First Minister, and meetings with all of the other party leaders as well. Very worthwhile. Similarly, in London, with political leaders, with civic leaders and church leaders. Important for the Church of Scotland to continue to be connected. Our own mini General Assembly was all online, of course, in October. Big learning curve for all of us in the hall and those at home. Again, we had some fun just to keep us going along the way. But perhaps most of all, I loved my series, It's a Fair Question. Hi folks, and welcome to the next episode of It's a Fair Question. We covered all manner of subjects and met all kinds of people. We talked to those who had had COVID, we talked to people who had suffered from drug addiction, we talked about racism, about interfaith, about dementia and any other number of subjects. So it was an online year. It really was. And here's a flavour of some of it. Hi folks. I am Martin and I'm presently serving as the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Well, of course, this year is very different, Hi, everybody. I wonder if some of you have seen the press coverage on the news and online. Hi, everybody. On this very special occasion, I'll say this again. If we're going to have effective congregations as we go forward, it won't happen with folks being half-hearted. Without people willing to serve, there is no church. Well, folks, we've made it. We've made it to this day, the day that signals the end of 2020. So yes, it was a year dominated by computer screens. But what do you do when that's the case? You keep calm and you carry on. Martin, before we go on to discuss uh, that video, I just wanted to say what a beautiful voice Elaine has and what a lovely piece of music that was. It wasn't that one that I was familiar with before this evening, but it was a really lovely and fitting piece that I'm sure everybody at home really enjoyed as well. So moving on to your, to your video there about your year, a thousand Zoom calls. You know, I think we expected you to have spent a lot of time online as we all have, but that's quite something. But were there any particular meetings that were really memorable for you and, and why? I mentioned in the video showing a, a couple of them. Gatherings, firstly, to remember 10 years of conflict in Syria. And I guess you think, well, you're sitting in your house, you're not with anybody else, and it's all very remote, but it was very real that night. It really was. We were invited to light candles. We did so, and we heard from people in Syria sharing their experiences. That brought it home to me, really, big style. And then also I mentioned when we were on Holocaust Memorial Day. Again, it was very, very moving. And an honor for me to represent the Church of Scotland at these events. And I suppose that's one of the things that you might have actually attended more events over this year because that technology has allowed you to be in more places, I guess, and meet people from further afield. So there is a silver lining to it, I guess. Mm. And you obviously talked about it's a fair question. What inspired you to create that content? I guess I'm really fond of interview programmes, going back to Michael Parkinson, maybe that's before your time, Shona, <laughs> uh, and some of the more up-to-date ones. So when it was clear to me that I wasn't going to be able to meet people in person in the same way, I thought, OK, we have to create a vehicle through which uh, I can meet people, speak to people, learn from people, and listen to people, and that's the key. I tried to bring people that would have something to say, that would be instructive for all of us. And yeah, listen, as a minister, <laughs> a message to all ministers out there, we've got to listen more perhaps. And uh, so I think the Fair Question series worked for that reason. People got to talk about life, about everything that we face in life. Uh, yeah, and I really like doing that, I have to say. And through that, did you learn anything new or take anything away from it that will stay with you? 
I'm just going to re-emphasize that business of listening. You know, so often when we go into a conversation, the other person's talking and you're busy thinking, what am I going to say next? But to do a proper interview, you've got to be actively listening to what the interviewee is saying so that you can respond. And I hope that that will teach me something about pastoral ministry, amongst other things. No, brilliant and probably a challenge to me tonight to really listen. <laughs> but um, before we go on to your next video, the other question I've got is what are your digital aspirations for the church? Because we've all had to adapt to this technology and going forward, we'll be thinking about what will stay, what will maybe not. So what are your kind of aspirations for the church in that sense? Well, that little sequence of, of video clips was entitled Hello Zoom. I really hope we don't now say Cheerio Zoom given that we will soon be back in our buildings. Of course, some churches already are, others are moving in that direction. So we still have an online general assembly this year. Maybe next year we'll be hybrid or we'll be back in the hall, but we must retain uh, our digital engagement. There are folks who are not going to walk through the door of our churches anytime soon, but can easily, in a non-threatening way, can catch something of what church is about. So please, church, let's keep our online content and let's make it as good as we possibly can in tandem with what we do in person. Yeah, I think definitely a lot of people have been able to um, join services in other parts of the country that they would never normally get to experience. So I think that's definitely right. Keeping that balance is going to be key going forward. So we've got our, our next video, I think, Martin, to show more of your year. Well, everything did change, but the church continued to do what the church does, just finding new ways to do it. Of course, worship is central to the life of the church. Elaine and I were only able to get to half a dozen churches in person, but we met wonderful people doing the very best in the circumstances. And wherever we went, we were made so very welcome. It was an entirely humbling experience. But the church learned to go online, and I did my best to support churches in making that possible. Hi everybody. Can I be really blunt with you? If you think that God is only to be found within a church building, then your idea of God is somewhat lacking. The truth of the matter is, that God is to be found everywhere, anywhere, at any time. Christians worship and Christians care for one another. I made over a thousand pastoral phone calls during the year, speaking to over 500 ministers and deacons individually, just trying to encourage and to listen. And on a few occasions, I offered the sacrament of communion online again to support colleagues. But we don't just care for one another, we care for our communities and so through the scented lament, artistic creation, thanks to Peter and Heidi for it, we gave the nation opportunity to express what it had lost in COVID. And of course, more of the same at Light for Lives, a year on from the first lockdown. Let us never forget that the church is called to be in the world and to speak and act prophetically, not least for those who are on the margins, those who struggle and suffer. And so it was for me as moderator to articulate the policies of the General Assembly and yes, to address situations as they arose throughout the course of the year. We're talking about race tonight and how that is experienced or racism, how that's experienced in Scotland in 2020. Yes, for as long as there are tragedies such as the death of asylum seeker Mercy Baguma, desperate people seeking sanctuary from war and oppression, the church must speak out. So too for homeless people, for those on the very edges, we speak and act. We look to support those who struggle with poor mental health. We advocate for Scotland to be better at that. And we're glad that our own cross-reach service is right at the heart of it. 
making a difference to everyday folks in the course of their lives. No miracles here? I say every time there are expressions of kindness and care and compassion and love, then there are miracles aplenty. So let's keep doing what we do best and let us keep calm and carry on. First of all, just a wee quick reminder to everyone, I'm sure you've got lots of questions yourself after these videos, so if you're on Zoom and Facebook, get your questions in or even some comments you'd like to pass on to Martin and we'll hopefully get them read out later on this evening. But Martin, on top of your 1,000 video calls, 500 uh, video calls and telephone calls to ministers and worship leaders, when you started your year or were planning your year, did you think it was going to have such a pastoral element to it? No, I didn't. I absolutely didn't. Uh, the diary was going to be full of events and traveling uh, and big scale things. But it became clear to me really quickly, listening to ministers, that they were under stress as never before in our lifetime. They were having to reinvent church. I say ministers, but of course they were doing it in tandem with elders and office bearers. But as a minister myself, I guess I had a particular affinity for what ministers were going through. So I just decided that one thing I could do was phone them up and assure them of my support and my prayers. And showing that each time, every conversation started with, how are you doing? And I gave people a chance to just answer that question. I want to put it on record tonight. I'm really sorry I didn't get to everybody. <laughs> My hope was to phone every single minister, deacon, reader, OLM, but time got the better of me. So sorry to everyone else. But you know, it was a real privilege to do it. Yeah, an opportunity to really speak to them one-on-one -on -one and just ask that important question of how are you doing, which I think we've all asked each other this past year and at different points it's been answered differently. Yeah, and you know, we Scots, we're so good at saying fine when we're asked, how are you doing? And fine can cover everything from I'm on top of the world to I'm really struggling right now. And you know what I enjoyed? I, I think so many ministers were honest with me. You know, I think you can do that sometimes better on the phone than if you're face to face. So there is a time for Zoom and for video conferencing, but the phone is a great tool and shouldn't be ignored. Mm -hmm. And as well, um, Martin, you spoke about some of the social justice issues that you obviously care very deeply about and were able to discuss and speak out about over the past year. Um, going forward, what issues do you think the Church of Scotland needs to be more focused on? Let me start by saying I will never be part of a church that just is focused solely on, let's say, singing hymns on a Sunday morning. I love singing hymns and songs. I can't wait to get back to that. But it's only part of what the Christian life's about. It's only part of what being in church is about. So the Church of Scotland, I think, is a great record of engaging widely with our communities, with our nation, and with our wider world. We must continue that prophetic voice, that willingness to critique when we see things that are just not how they should be and that run counter to kingdom values. So there's so much that was in that video. Um, you know, it was brilliant during this last year that there was a treaty signed internationally um, against the proliferation of nuclear weapons, but at the same time, UK government didn't sign up to it, so let's continue to press on that one. And uh, of course, the, the green issues and our, our, our concern for the environment, absolutely, that's gotta be front and center. But let me just say this, I came into this year, this year saying that we must focus on mental health, poor mental health. That was a pandemic shown along before the MD had ever heard of COVID. And Scotland has a poor track record. So that was my thought at the beginning of the year. And here we are at the end. It's no different. And if anything, the issues are, are, are harder now because people have been isolated. People have been stressed. So please let the church, and I mean by that nationally, regionally, and locally, let, let the church be there for people listening being compassionate, and just helping people walk through the struggles that many are enduring now. 
as they work through what's going on, yeah, and sometimes struggling with mental health. And I think sometimes it seems like we need to do really big grand acts to, to kind of help these issues or um, address them. But as you've already said, a simple phone call can be enough to start a conversation, particularly when it comes to mental health. But how can local congregations get involved with other issues in their communities? You spoke about racism and obviously the climate crisis. How can they get involved in that locally? I think it begins by just going to the door of the church and looking out and seeing what's there. My own congregation, for example, has a long track record now of working, working alongside those who have struggled with addiction. And that only came about through awareness. Uh, and you don't get that if we're just solely concerned with the life of our congregations and with, might I put it this way, with our own survival. The only way we will survive is by being engaged with the wider world. So I just encourage churches to listen, to look, and to discern where God is leading us, how we might be supporting those on the margins, those that often fall between the cracks of what local authority provision might be. So yeah, it's not impossible. Um, I think we pray for discernment, for God's leading. We look and we see where the need is, and then we prepare to get out into our communities and not be afraid to get our hands dirty. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So come on, church. This is an era of serving. So as local congregations take that kind of message back and they do start to consider church life after the pandemic. Do you have any specific words of encouragement or a key message you'd like them to take as they go on to try do some of this work? Shona, it's very obvious that this has been a very difficult year for the church, congregationally speaking, and for the church nationally. We've faced challenges that none of us saw coming. We talked about Zoom. Who'd ever heard of Zoom before March of last year? I hadn't, I have to confess. So it's been very difficult, and it's not going to be a bed of roses in terms of being easy in the coming weeks and months. We've got a challenge ahead of us. But, you know, in the words of the song that Elaine sang we heard earlier, it is well, it is well, keep my eyes fixed on you. That was the line. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who came and who is our life and who must be our inspiration. And without that, you know, I, I quite happily say we're done. But Jesus, if he is at the heart of everything we try to do and try to be as church in the days forward, then I'm hopeful, I'm confident. And I would say to congregations, let's go forward with, you know, our faith absolutely central to what we do and with our eyes fixed on Jesus. And definitely, once you've taken that first step, I think that can seem like the scariest bit, but once you start, you can keep going and you'll be encouraged by one another. So I think we're moving on to our fourth video now, Martin. So much of last year was spent living under COVID restrictions, with all of us enduring long periods of time more or less confined to barracks. Well, it was no different for me, and so I resolved that when circumstances allowed, I would get myself outdoors as much as was possible. First of all, because it's good for our health. But more than that, I wanted to point to the growing reality and appreciation of outdoor spirituality. And I wanted also to make it clear that as far as I'm concerned, there is no authentic Christian spirituality today that doesn't include giving thanks for creation and committing ourselves to caring for it. The first undertaking was as part of the week of prayer that we ran last August. In company with Gregor, one of my chaplains, and Richard, one of our military chaplains, we set off on a non-stop journey to climb the four Cardinal Munros at the north, south and east and west parts of Scotland, 
It was a great adventure. We loved every minute. But most of all, we were praying for Scotland, for its people and for our church in these days. And then during Holy Week, I engaged in a week of pilgrimage walking in preparation for Easter. It was an absolute joy. Spent exclusively in my local authority area, Angus, I discovered so much that I hadn't been aware of before, as I sought to be at one with the environment and to trace the footsteps of those who have gone before us in faith. A particular highlight was at St Fergus's Well by Glams. But all the while, while walking, while soaking it all in, I was being still within and listening for God. I'm glad to say that by the end of my week of pilgrimage walks, I was very much in that place. Sensing my oneness with my surroundings and knowing God's nearness. That's pilgrimage. What else? Well, I walked a chunk of the John Muir Way and to support Christian aid, I walked along a length of the River Tay in the Kilt Walk. Great fun for a good cause, but again, being close to the earth and in walking, being close to God. So in all of that, it was a case of putting one foot in front of the other and keeping going. And hasn't that been what this last year has been about? Keeping going. Yes, keeping calm and carrying on. So Martin, one of the few freedoms that many of us have enjoyed over this past year is getting outdoors and, as you said, maybe seeing parts of our local authority we didn't know mm. it covered. Um, but what would you say to people exploring faith outdoors as a new experience? I think, first of all, go for it. You don't have to walk hundreds of miles. You can be outdoors, of course, in, in your garden, if you're fortunate enough to have one, or in a local park and so on. But what I've discovered, Shona, in more recent days is that the very exercise of walking can become a spiritual discipline. That I used to think, well, I'll go walking and there I'll pray. But I've discovered that even walking itself is prayer and brings me into a real sense of oneness with God. Now, of course, you can be at one with God anywhere, anytime. So that means indoors as well. But I have found it to be so releasing, so energizing, uh, just to be close to God. And I think you can get that when the big blue sky is above you. I know it does happen in Scotland every so often. Uh, or by the sea, or in the mountains, or in very simple places, if you're not able to go far afield. Just be outdoors and see if perhaps you don't connect with God in a really special way. And I mean, your step count is clearly higher than probably most of ours, but was there a view or a particular walk that was really stood out for you and you'll, you'll remember? Let me mention a couple. I talked about with Gregor and Richard, we climbed the four Cardinal Monroes. Now, there are 282 Monroes. You were telling me earlier you're going to do your first one soon, so come on, get with the project. <laughs> uh, there's one, the, the one to the, the north of Scotland, the one furthest to the south and the east and the west. These are the Cardinal Monroes. The first one we went to was Ben Hope in the very north of Scotland. You know, we needed hope in the midst of 2020. And as we stood on that summit, looking at the superb scenery of that northern part of our country, we prayed for hope. So that will stay with me. And I think in my pilgrimage week in Angus, going to ancient Christian places and becoming aware that I'm standing where our mothers and fathers before us in faith were. 
Now, they've come through all kinds of challenges, so we need to rise to the challenges that we're facing, have the courage that they had. So yeah, the pilgrimage walk gave me a great sense of the continuity in which we stand in faith. And what would you say to somebody who's never been on a pilgrimage before and would maybe like to explore that? Again, just try, just start. You can do major pilgrimages, hundreds of miles long, some of them uh, uh, on the continent, but there's a growing network of pilgrimage paths right here in Scotland, over a thousand miles in existence or in planning. You don't have to do it all in one. Uh, for example, in the Fife Trail, just do a few miles if you're able. If not, there are virtual pilgrimages for those who are maybe housebound but can get online. So explore, try it out. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And it, yeah, definitely. And it's something I would really like to try. So I'll definitely give one of those new ones in Scotland uh, a shot. But you mentioned there, obviously, some people being outdoors for long periods of time or walking great distances is quite a challenge for, which is what the virtual pilgrimages will be great for. But in what other ways can people maybe deepen their connection to creation if they can't get outdoors a lot? Do you know, this may seem like a kind of ordinary kind of answer, but make use of the fantastic documentaries that we have available to us. Uh, I can't watch a David Attenborough program, for example, and not end up going, wow, look at this amazing earth that we have to inhabit and to care for. Or, you know, I can't say that I've got green fingers, I can't say that I'm good in that department, but maybe have some plants or some flowers indoors and take time maybe just to look at some of the plants that are around us. So it doesn't have to be in the top of a mountain or walking on a deserted beach in the Northwest Highlands. Just find what you can locally to connect. Yeah, and caring for creation and climate justice is obviously a huge topic for the church as it is globally eh, for everyone. So what can local congregations do to play their part in this discussion and how can they engage in outdoor spirituality? Well, of course, there already are a good number of Church of Scotland congregations that are eco-congregations. I want to be really upfront and say, why isn't every congregation an eco-congregation? It's really a non-negotiable in the 21st century that we be signed up to that agenda and that we be taking it very, very seriously. So let's see more and ultimately all congregations engaged in that. But you know what lots of congregations have done just locally to their situation? They've used the little bits of grounds that they've got perhaps around their buildings. They've developed beautiful, beautiful sensory gardens, peaceful places where people can sit, or they've set up labyrinths and so on. So be creative. Uh, check out what others are doing and be inspired to do something on your own doorstep. Yeah, and, and with the eco-congregation message, what a statement that would be in the year that we get ready to host COP26. But Martin, I think we're about to get ready for some questions for you or some comments uh, that people have been putting in on Facebook and on Zoom. If you've not already and you've got one sitting there burning ready to go, please uh, get it in if you're on Zoom and Facebook. So... Um, We've got one coming in right now. So first one, Martin, are you going to continue with your It's a Fair Question series once you go back to our both? Yeah, do you know, I have thought about that, Shona. There are lots of things that you do for a year during your year serving as moderator, and that's the way it should be. And in that connection, I absolutely look forward to Jim's year and I'm going to follow with great interest uh, how Jim leads us through the year that's coming. But as for it's a fair question, I think I might. Um, I think there are still a thousand and one people out there that I would love to engage with and learn from and hear from. So yeah, I'll maybe take a bit of a break, but it may be something that I will keep going. And uh, I guess if there's an audience out there for it, then it makes sense. Great. I'm sure a lot of people will be excited to see that if it continues. Sheila and Stephen said that they loved watching your Easter pilgrimage and they want to know how your feet are doing. <laughs> well, do you know, the very first day of that pilgrimage walk, I did 27 miles 
in new boots. I mean, I'd, I'd kind of broken them in with a couple of short walks, but nothing like as long as that. And so, my feet were weary that day, and through the rest of that week, they never quite recovered. I had blisters and cuts all over them. But look, let me make a serious point out of that. Sometimes it is tough, but you've got to keep going. You know, I was out in quite remote places at times. There wasn't a bus coming along anytime soon, or I couldn't hail a cab. And so, yeah, my feet were sore. They really were, but you just keep going. And in doing things like that, I think you, you learn lessons for life. Haven't we had to do that during this last year? Just keep going. That's what it's all about. So we've had lots of lovely comments about Elaine's singing and the piece of music that she was singing. It was really, really beautiful. But lots of people also want to know, uh, Martin, what other things Elaine was able to get involved in during your auditorial year? Well, let me put on record tonight and uh, just so that everybody knows, I couldn't have done this year without Elaine. Um, she has her own career, so she was never going to be full-time uh, with me, but she had arranged with her employers that she would take time out and she would spend uh, time with me more so than what was possible. So that was what was planned. So when things began to unravel by way of the program, she was an absolute rock uh, and was right there with me, supporting me and encouraging me every step of the way. So I say a huge thank you. Uh, Elaine's been that for me through, well, not just our marriage. We've known each other and we're best friends since preschool. So she's been with me all the way, absolutely my best friend in life and has been right there. So that's the main thing, just her support and her encouragement all the way through it. When things were possible, uh, when we were able to visit churches in person, of course, she came with me and it was lovely to have her by my side and to experience just some of what the year involved. Next, we've got Susan, who would like to know who would be in your favorite praise band? <laughs> who would be in my favorite praise band? Smashing question. Well. Let me say the lead vocalist would have to be Elaine. You know, I'm, uh, I'm uh, <laughs> keeping in her good books there. Um, I love contemporary music. I really do contemporary Christian worship music. And uh, some of my favorites would be people like Matt Redman and uh, Chris Tomlin and so on. But I love some of the traditional church music that's come to us down through the years. I love the hymns, for example, of Isaac Watts. Uh, when I survey the wondrous cross, that will never be out of date or tired or old. So I would have great people in that praise band, and I would have somebody like Isaac Watts uh, writing material for us. Quite eclectic then. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so a lot of people have said how professional your videos are, Martin, um, how well put together they are. So some people want to know if there's a blooper reel out there. <laughs> yeah, some of which will never see the light of day, I can assure <laughs> you that. Uh, the church couldn't afford the legal fees that would come our way. Um, yeah, there have been some mistakes and uh, you just keep going. That, many ways that's been our theme tonight, showing you just keep going and you, you make the best of it. But be prepared to laugh at yourself and don't ever take yourself too seriously. But you know, in terms of those videos, it's amazing what you can do with a smartphone and not much else. And uh, yeah, we've got a fantastic tech team in the hall tonight making this possible. They've got the gear to die for. But hey, Let's not get envious. You can do it if you've got a smartphone and you've got some creative ideas. Craig, next, would like to know what is the first thing that you want to do when things get back to normal? Well, I've really missed going out for dinner. Uh, Elaine and I were looking forward to living the year in Edinburgh, spending time here together, going to the cinema, to the theater, going to cafes and restaurants in this fantastic cosmopolitan city. And who knew for most of the year, much of that was shut down. So I'm very much looking forward to those kind of things, socially speaking, to go to the cinema again, to eat out. 
In terms of the life of the church, I mentioned it earlier, and I know that folks right across Scotland and beyond will share this with me. Please, please, let's have that day come when we can sing praises again, when we can lift our voices, rejoicing uh, in the wonders of our Lord, what He has done for us and continues to do for us. That is really what I'm looking forward to. So Brian wants to know what one new thing the Church of Scotland can do as an organization to move forward and progress as we come out of this pandemic. Hmm. Well, just one thing. I think there are so many uh, and much that we have learned during this last year. Let me just focus on the digital for a moment. There was a man that I engaged with through a pastoral situation in my own parish many years ago. He was so desperately seeking some meaning and some answers in his life, but he had no connection with church in any form, neither did his family or his friend circle. So the whole business of coming to church, going to church was totally alien to him. Many times in our conversations, he said to me, I'm going to come, I'm going to come, I have to find something. And yet he couldn't make himself come over the threshold. Those of us whose life is in church, we can't get our heads around that. But understand that it's difficult for some folk. Well, guess what? He joined us and came and engaged when we were online. So I saw again, say again, let's not put all of the digital toys back in the box. That must be part of our ministry as we go forward. I think this will be the final question we might have time for, um, but Ruth would like to know, Martin, what you would like to say to the newly appointed Minister for Mental Wellbeing and Social Care who's been appointed to the Scottish Government today. I'm delighted that the Scottish Government has made clear that it's going to invest and it's going to take this subject seriously. It is not good enough for someone to show up with serious mental health struggles, and to be told that there's an appointment that is either months away or even longer is measured in terms of years. We can't go on with that. It's as well saying to somebody, we can't help you whatsoever. So, government, our authorities, let's take that seriously. But at the same time, you know when we've got issues like this in our country, let's not just sit back and say, what is the government going to do about it? Let's say, what are we going to do about it? Church, communities, all working together. That's how we will begin to make a difference in terms of supporting those in our nation and beyond who struggle with mental health. Martin, I've actually now got a bit of a surprise for you. Um, you don't know this is coming, so, uh, but it's a lovely video. People wanted to let you know how much of an impact you've had on their lives this past year. So I hope you enjoy this wee piece. I'm John Cowie, Minister of Stockbridge Church in Edinburgh. I want to express my appreciation and my thanks to the work that Martin did in reaching out to parish ministers like me who were working around the country during the pandemic time, sometimes uh, just desperately trying to keep in touch with people and the knowledge that he in his wider role as moderator was keeping in touch with hundreds of ministers hundreds of people in different functions it was important to us and a great encouragement and perhaps a stimulus for us to go out and make our own contacts and make them real in the way that he did hi martin remember this place st Moloag's in tarland Cremar parish church your first engagement with a physical congregation present after you became moderator, here to celebrate with us our 150th anniversary. We have been only one of a handful of congregations that you've been able to visit. Thank you for the memories you gave us that day and for the present you left with us. It was uh, very special to meet with you and Elaine. To say that you are one in a million would be a silly cliche to land on you. But how about one 
in 150. Seems appropriate somehow. Take care. Hello, Martin. With Fife behind me, I bring you greetings from Fife Presbytery. We met for the first time online on the 6th of February, and we were born out of the three legacy presbyteries of Dunfermline, Kirkcaldy, and St Andrews, becoming one presbytery family. When you appeared on screen, your familiar face and your encouraging message went a long way to draw us together. Your setting was your kitchen, a place you said of nourishment and of rolling up your sleeves to work and how we need to do both. On the 6th of February, most of us realised we didn't know two thirds of our own presbytery, but we all knew you and your presence, your being with us was strengthening and encouraging and unifying. Thank you, Martin, and God bless your continuing ministry. If you were able to watch any of the series, It's a Fair Question, hosted by Martin, then I'm sure you'll agree it was a great discussion platform. Reaching out to a variety of people, Martin facilitated the sharing of stories and the impact of those stories on people's faith journeys. And they did it in a chatty and an informative way. During the various lockdowns, the clips gave us a wee something to look forward to and be inspired by people's faith journeys. So thanks, Martin, for keeping us connected and for raising issues of importance during this COVID pandemic. Thank you. There you go, Martin. Just an insight into the impact that you've had on other people uh, this year. And so I think it might be appropriate if we move to your final video of the evening. When speaking to some of my predecessors, former moderators, they've often spoken about places that they visited during their year of service. Well, of course, that wasn't possible for me. And so much of my ministry as moderator was conducted from this place, this little nook in our manse here in our broth. But from here, I was able to reach out and engage with and connect with perhaps more people than any of my predecessors, thanks to our reliance this year, newly found reliance on digital technology. So it was not so much about places, but it very much was about people. And I'll always be thankful for the people that I got to connect with. Some of course, from the very upper echelons of our society. Do you know, that I had a phone call from Her Majesty the Queen. Not many people can say that the Queen gave them a ring. I connected too with Prime Ministers and First Ministers, with Archbishops and Primacies, with politicians of every colour, with folks from civic society, from the military, oh, from every walk of life. So too with some well-known people Ricky Ross, Sally Magnuson, and Stuart and Tam from Off the Ball, definitely one of the highlights of my year. Well, I am your typical Scots guy who loves football and even more loves talking about football. So what could be better to be a guest on Off the Ball with Stuart and Tam, a lifetime ambition coming true. But do you know, in my year, I got to speak too to lots of ordinary folk. And in my view, it's the ordinary folk in the end that matter most. So, not so much places, but very definitely people. And early in my year, I quickly recognised that my colleagues in ministry, folks who serve in all capacities within the church, were going to be under more pressure perhaps than ever before, because we were in such uncharted territories. And so I committed myself to be a pastor to the church and to my colleagues in particular, doing everything I could to support them in what was, of course, a very challenging year. I hope in some way I helped them to keep going, knowing that I was there for them. Yes, they did persevere, there's the next of the letter P's. 
sometimes when you don't know for sure what the future holds and when you don't know which direction to choose sometimes all you can do is take it one day at a time to keep going and yes to persevere while i wasn't able to do much of what was planned i certainly was able to pray and that's what i did throughout the whole year praying for the church yes the country more widely and for situations across the world as was appropriate but i focused my prayer for the church during this year yes for my colleagues for those within the church who bear much responsibility at this time and for congregations and newly forming presbyteries for office bearers for children's workers for youth leaders oh you name it i prayed and i prayed for the church at the same time i knew myself to be prayed for gosh that made all the difference it really did particularly in those times when i was struggling and i did struggling at times just to keep going and to keep enthusiastic and energetic for the task that was mine during those moments to know that people were praying for me did make all the difference two more letter p's first of all providence many folks were kind enough to say that they felt that i was just the right person to serve as moderator during this very unique year well that's for others to say but in as much as it might be true then i am thankful to god that in god's providence this was the way it worked out maybe it was my skill set and my experiences which were helpful to me during this year serving as moderator so maybe providential and finally privilege regardless of the fact that it was a very different year what an enormous privilege to serve as moderator yes to serve the church and in that way to serve the lord that's all i've ever wanted to do as moderator and when i pass on the reins to jim I'll return to serving in my local community with my local congregation. But for this year, to do so nationally, I will count it always as an enormous privilege. And I put on record my sincere thanks for the, to the church for entrusting me with the role of moderator. Thank you. So you mentioned your year was more about people rather than places, Martin. Are there any individuals that made a particular impact on your year? How long have you got? <laughs> I'll mention just two. There's a young man that I met here in Edinburgh. He'd come through all of life struggles, uh, serious addiction, homelessness, and he'd come through that and now he's running a superb support programme for those that are in that same place right here in the city centre. Uh, absolutely inspirational what somebody well motivated can do. So I'll remember him long, um, long days to come. And then just one of the ministers that I phoned, the very day I phoned, he'd come home from hospital having been diagnosed with cancer. And that was the day, you call that a chance or say there's something more, but that was the day I phoned and said to him, how are you? And he told me, the really good news shown is that after surgery and treatment, he got it all clear. So I remember and give thanks to God for that and for him. And if it wasn't for you making that phone call, you wouldn't have known about that and known about that story. So that just goes to show how important they really were and, and learning more about all the ministers in the church yeah. and what they are going through as well. But you'll also know as moderator that the PA to you is a huge, huge help. And Catherine, she, I know, has been a huge help to you throughout the past year. Yeah, 
If there's one person to thank, it's Catherine, moderator's uh, personal assistant. She is superb at what she does. Just the most efficient and effective person you would ever hope to meet. And a real strong defender of the moderator. And uh, she was always there for you. It never was anything to trouble. So to Catherine, um, thank you so very, very much, Catherine. You know, I, I think you're watching tonight, Catherine. I really hope that you will hear that and know that to be sincere. Uh, and, to, and to Jim, Lord Wallace, who will assume the role of moderator, hey, with Catherine, you will be all right. <laughs> and so just as we kind of come to the conclusion, almost of our time together here, Martin, I've got some quick kind of fire questions for okay. you. The first one is, what will you miss most from your moderatorial year? Do you know, Shona, I, I, I thought about that and the answer is not that much because here's the thing. What did I do as moderator? I served. What will I do when I go back? I'll continue to serve. It will just be in a different sphere. I will miss all of the connections with people nationally. Uh, and uh, of course, I can keep that up. But the focus will be back to the local. But, you know, across this country and across this church, we have fabulous people. How good it has been to connect with so many of them. I will miss that for sure. And is there anything that you're glad to leave behind at all? <laughs> well, do you know, as we move into something like more normal life, I hope that this year won't involve a thousand Zoom calls. <laughs> and by the way, that doesn't include Teams and all those other things. So, yeah, I've done enough video conferences for a lifetime. So yeah, there'll still be some, but hopefully not so many. Hopefully not a thousand. And is there anything that you're really looking forward to as you move back to your parish life in Arbroath? I love my, I love my folk, Shona. I've been minister in Arbroath. Well, at the end of this year, it'll be 30 years. It's incredible. Folk will be thinking, gosh, you must have started when you were only 10. You look so young. <laughs> uh, not. Um, I'm really looking forward to get back to my people. Um, we've lost some, some of our much-loved people through, through, through this last year and, uh, and, and some through COVID. And so that's been heartbreaking not to be there for my people. So I'm really looking forward to getting back to our broth, to St. Andrew's Church, and with them saying, OK, guys, where are we going now? How do we get the show back on the road after COVID and, you know, really be all we can be? Mm -hmm. And last one, you've already given Jim the heads up about how fantastic Catherine's going to be for him. <laughs> but is there any words of wisdom you'd like to pass on to him as he gets ready to take on the role? You know, all the other previous moderators gave me words of wisdom about what my year was going to be like, and it proved to be nothing <laughs> of the sort. So I don't want to prejudge what Jim's year is going to be like, but I would certainly say this to him, Jim, enjoy it. Make the most of every moment. Be ready to adapt. Be ready to change tack if circumstances demand it of you. But maybe this above all, because I can only say this is what I try to be, just be yourself. We um, will install you on Saturday Gym as moderator, and we're doing that because we believe in you. We didn't mean you to be something other than what you are, so be yourself. I tried that. I think it worked. Be yourself, Jim. Well, Martin, we've absolutely loved having you as our moderator. And unfortunately, that's the end of our questions tonight. But there's one more final piece that Elaine is going to sing for us this evening. I'll let you introduce it. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier, Shona, in what I was saying about the privilege that it was to pray for the church during this time. And through that, to ask a blessing over the church. And now, as we, as we finish up tonight, I'm going to ask Elaine, well, of course, we've pre-recorded it, but you know what I mean. She's going to sing now a blessing. And I really hope that wherever you are tonight joining us online, that you will know the truth of God's blessing upon you right here, right now. So that's what Elaine's going to sing, the blessing. <laughs>
Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. That's us come to the end of our time here tonight, Martin, and it's been great speaking with you. I hope everybody watching has really enjoyed hearing about your year, and we wish you well as you go back to life in our growth, and we wish Jim well as he enters the role of moderator on Saturday when he's in inducted. So thank you so much again to everyone, and good night.